Welcome back. Let's talk some Dynasty Fantasy Football trades. I had y'all submit them through the Discord. And remember, every time you submit one in the Discord, free to join down below. Links down below. You can talk Fantasy, Dynasty, all that kind of sheesh. You must add hashtag congrats, Scott. That's how I find your Dynasty trades. Now that I found them, my shirt is going to find its way into my pants. Get it. First trade here comes from my good friend Isaiah B. Fade the Fetal. This is a league that I'm actually in. This is tiered PPR. So he gets A.J. Brown. He is giving up Hollywood Brown, Tyler Algier, the 2023 309, and a 2024 unspecified first. Now, tiered PPR means half PPR for running backs, full PPR for wide receivers, and 1.5 for tight ends. This is a league that we started a couple years ago, and I absolutely love these scoring settings. If you're looking for something new, something spicy, uh, and you're starting a new Dynasty League, I would very highly consider using this as your scoring settings. So I think we need to start to break down the trades. And anytime you see a Dynasty trade with a lot of pieces, try to break each piece down individually to get a, a value for each otherwise it gets a it gets really really confusing so that 2023 309 ended up being eric gray okay new york giants second third maybe not even making the fucking team running back and with Bijan robinson getting drafted by atlanta you know you're looking at tyler Algier being a, a borderline just nothing throw in there and anytime you're looking at like big player names in a trade like an aj brown and, and and first round rookie picks and stuff like that i almost completely wipe off players like eric ray and tyler Argier. like sure they're really minimal value added points but they'll never be the reason why you swing one way or another on a trade with players like aj brown on the board okay so we kind of wipe those out they're 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 very like borderline nothing pieces so when you do that you're looking at hollywood brown and a 2024 first round pick now assuming that's isaiah's first round pick and again i'm in this league so i have more context to it it's going to be a late first round pick he was he either finished in third or fourth place last year he has jonathan taylor joe mixon aj brown justin jefferson i'm on ross st brown two to three good solid starting quarterbacks so he's like a very good starting lineup i think again he'll probably get into the playoffs if not exceed those expectations with other players coming onto his team this year next thing i would look at is like marquise brown what is he worth with like the uncertainty at quarterback in arizona and his future in arizona just up for grabs obviously he can put together like a good high volume campaign for this year maybe as the number one target but we kind of saw him be able to be that guy last year and he was good for PPR but it wasn't really great you know he was he had high volume games but he never really like connected on deep balls he didn't do what we thought he was going to do so he was fine but he was not like a game breaker so I, I look at you know what would Hollywood Brown be worth in terms of like a rookie pick right now and I think he's probably a mid second rounder right if you're if you're giving up a, a rookie pick or if you're trading hollywood you're getting probably like a mid second rounder maybe closer to the end of the second round because this is both super flex and tight end premium so those guys are worth even more and rookie picks are worth a little bit more in the second round so i think he's probably like a mid second round pick maybe like the 207 208 so once we do that math let, let's go like super generous here and you say that the Hollywood Brown turns into like the 203. Let's let's value him at the 203, which again I think is generous given the standards, uh, given the settings here. And that first turns into the 107. Let's say Isaiah B's team, who I think is very good, uh, gets the six seed out of 12 in the playoffs and gets knocked out first round. He gets the first pick of the playoff teams. So you're basically looking at this trade and saying, would you trade the 2024 107 and the 203 this year? for AJ Brown in full PPR. You're doing that in a second. And again, that's best case scenario for these other pieces here. Brown is worth two first rounders for sure. And not late. I'm thinking, you know, like the 105, the 107, uh, an early first and a back end first, not like the 111, 112, certainly not the 107 and the 203. So when you start to break down trades into pieces, things become a lot more clear here. And the first thing that stands off the board here to me is like, if you're, if you're trading away AJ Brown you need something elite on the other side of that trade so the AJ Brown is an absolute dub trade here trade number two from Gentry congrats Scott we have one quarterback full PPR 10 teamer he's receiving Calvin Ridley Terry McLaurin and Kenneth Walker he's giving up Chris Godwin and Miles Sanders at first glimpse you know you say to yourself Gentry absolutely won this trade like dominated this trade but when you look deeper you say to yourself Gentry absolutely without a doubt 
dominated this trade. When you start, again, to look at the individual pieces, right, it's easy to be like, oh, it's full PPR. Kenneth Walker doesn't catch passes. Can we talk about how bad Miles Sanders was catching passes last year? If we're just going running back for running back, and then we'll go wide receiver for wide receiver. Miles Sanders last year ranked 49th in targets among running backs, 48th in receptions, 73rd in receiving yards. The only back in the top 35 fantasy running backs last year that had fewer receiving yards than Miles Sanders was Jamal Williams. And he had five fewer receiving yards on 10 fewer targets. Miles Sanders was abysmal and he's gotten worse and worse each year as a pass catching statistical running back. And I get it, Jalen Hurts doesn't throw the ball as much to his running backs. But again, he's, he's been getting worse and worse on third downs as he's been in the in the uh, NFL longer. And now he's going over to Carolina where Deuce Daly is a running backs coach. And I know that they work together in Philadelphia, but Deuce Daly's always operated with a committee at running back. And he said he wanted to do that in Carolina prior to bringing in Miles Sanders. So his appeal for me in PPR leagues is is pretty low. In full PPR last year, he was the RB22 despite dominating on the ground. Career year, like 1,250 rushing yards, 11 rushing touchdowns, and still finish as the RB22 in full PPR. And I like Godwin a lot. But I love Ridley and I love McClure. I like both of those individual pieces pretty much just as much as I like Chris Godwin. And you're getting two of them. So that's massive dub for Gentry. Let's move over to trade number three for Mr. Jimbo Slice. 12 team, full PPR, super flex. Jonathan Taylor for Isaiah Pacheco, a 2023 107 and a 2024 second round pick. So Pacheco at first seems kind of like an intriguing player, right? He's like a young running back that you want on your dynasty team, but it's really important not to overvalue him in full PPR leagues, which this is. He's almost a zero in the passing game. He had zero targets inside the 10 yard line last year. McKinnon had 11 of them. He had zero targets on third downs last year. McKinnon had 21 of them. Very clear, clearly divided what their roles are, and Pacheco's not involved in the passing game. McKinnon re-signed there. Pacheco last year was the RB 37 in PPR. Overall last year, if you look at it on a points-per-game basis, filtering out anyone that played less than 10 games, so you're talking about every running back that played more than 10 games or 10 games or more, Pacheco was the RB44 points per game in full PPR last year, which is what this league is. That's terrible. It's borderline unusable. So you're talking about Pacheco, who's like an RB3 maybe, and then you have the 107 and and a second rounder. So I want to talk about, you know, the 107 a little bit here. For this year's crop, like there's a giant tier break after the 106 for me, which is a huge piece of this trade and a huge piece of why I want Jonathan Taylor's side of this trade because you have the three quarterbacks, obviously. You have Bijan, you have Jameer Gibbs, you have JSN. If you can't get one of those, you see a tier break to these next group of wide receivers. The other guys that went in that 20 to 25 range, which was Zay Flowers, Quentin Johnston, and Jordan Addison. They're all appealing. Like we obviously want all these guys. Everyone wants a piece of these guys because the upside is there. All the rookie wide receivers in fantasy football are always like they're always sexy. They're always the shiny new toy. But I want you, I want you to, uh, I want you to stay with me here. This is gonna make no fucking sense, but I'm gonna try my hardest to explain just how level-headed you need to be about these rookie wide receivers coming in. So what I did was I went back and over the last 15 years, I wanted to look at the wide receivers that were picked in that same range. So I looked from first round picks, draft capital somewhere from 20 to 32. So the back half of that first round. So there have been a total of 84 seasons and the 84 seasons are based on the first three seasons of those guys. So now we're down to wide receivers picked in the NFL draft from 20 to 32 and their first three seasons. I want to see how often they hit that wide receiver three pedestal. Of the 84 season sample size, only 33 of them scored 12 PPR fantasy points per game in a season, in their first three seasons. Just one season of over 12 fantasy points per game. That's 39%. So you're talking about a 39% chance of one of those guys having a 12 plus PPR fantasy point per game season in their first three years. So it's like, sure, one of them could end up being a wide receiver one. The chances are not that. They're on the other side of that. It's it's just all these stats that I'm throwing at you right now are just to help you be realistic about what that pick probably is. It's probably like a wide receiver two, which is not a needle mover on fantasy teams. And then you just add a second. And the chances of that guy hitting are even lower than all the numbers I just threw out for you there. So again, the Jonathan Taylor side is just getting by far and away the best piece of this trade. You have Pacheco, who's not a great PPR back. You have the 107, who's appealing, but you like the shiny toy more than the shiny toy is actually worth. And then a random second, which of course you want extra picks. But again, none of these three pieces are appealing enough to equal 
what Jonathan Taylor could be in his better seasons. He's 24. He's coming off probably the worst year of his career with injuries and the team was terrible and he still averaged over 91 yards per game. We've seen him at full strength just a year prior going over 2,000 yards from scrimmage. He's a true league winning back and you're not getting anything close to a league winning player on any part of that side of the trade. So JT Dub. Trade number four from the dishonorable Judge Sexual Patterstein, the fourth of his family's name. Now, the league setting for this one. Superflex, six point per passing touchdown league. So the throwing QBs get uh, a little bit of a bump here. Sexy got Joe Burrow and Jalen Warren. He gave up Mac Jones and the 101. So we're going to assume the 101 is Bijan Robinson. For me, this is so easily far and away the Joe Burrow side of this deal. There's a few ways to look at this. I, I think the first thing to say is like, if Joe Burrow was available to be picked in rookie drafts right now, where would he go? You're not, and I don't mean like Joe Burrow as a prospect, you're drafting Joe Burrow exactly as he is right now, three years, four years into his career, entering his prime. There, the fact that some people are debating Anthony Richardson as the 101 in Superflex Leagues over Joe Burrow, with and Anthony Richardson has a, like a 50-50 chance of, of hitting and being a good NFL quarterback, should probably tell you all you need to know there. Because Joe Burrow's already there. Joe Burrow's already throwing for 4,500 yards a season. He's already throwing for 35-plus passing touchdowns a season. This guy's bringing his team to the Super Bowl year in and year out. Conference championship year in and year out. Already got Jamar Chase. Already got T. Higgins. Already got them building an offensive line around him. There's no question mark here. The only question for Joe Burrow is how much better does he get? How much more upside does he have? How, how much better is he going to get in his year 25 to 28 seasons? Probably a lot. So, yeah, of course you want B. John Robinson on your fantasy team, but Burrow... And these types of like elite quarterbacks are the single most coveted assets in Dynasty Superflex leagues. And I think the more important part, what you really need to understand here is understanding your league settings because that six point per passing touchdown league is a massive shift in how you rank your quarterbacks. In this type of league, six point per passing touchdown league, last year Joe Burrow averaged 29 fantasy points per game. Okay, so for every three touchdowns you score, you're getting an extra six points. So if normally you're averaging 23 fantasy points per game, throwing three touchdowns per game, two and a half touchdowns per game, whatever, you are now averaging 28, 29 fantasy points per game. Like as incredible as Justin Fields was last year, he averaged 23.8 fantasy points per game in these league types. That's a full five fantasy points per game fewer than Joe Burrow in this league type, okay? Tua, Tua averaged more fantasy points per game than Justin Fields did in this type of format, all right? So don't underestimate the settings here for this league. Now, obviously, Mac Jones in a super flex league is more than just a throw-in, and Jalen Warren is kind of like a whatever piece. Sure, I like him, but again, not the type of player that moves a trade of this magnitude. But the delta between Burrow and any non-elite starting quarterback in Superflex is, in my opinion, more than Mac Jones. And trade number five, we get into a little dynasty just startup draft trade. Scooter McGavin receives the 211 the 311 and the 511 and gives up his 104. So we're going to throw out the names that he picked there because it says that Dak Prescott won at the 211, Michael Pittman won at the 511. We're going to look at this as just raw picks in a dynasty startup draft. So he gives up a super premium pick. The 104 is a, is a player that you get and is now a starting player at a premium position for the next five, 10 years on your team. But you're getting a ton of fucking depth, the 211, 311, and 511, which again, can't be understated because there are so many really good players for your dynasty team at those picks. I am a huge proponent. I am a huge fan of moving back in your dynasty startup draft. I love moving your first round pick for depth pieces like this. I think the best way of looking at this trade is actually trying to put players and pieces to those draft picks, okay? So if we went to a site like Fantasy Calc right now, fantasycalc.com, awesome free resource, you can look at who's going 211, 311, 511. So 211, you're looking at players like Brees Hall, Deshaun Watson, Kyler Murray, Amon Ross St. Brown, and either of like the uh, rookie, any of the rookie quarterbacks not named Anthony Richardson. So you could have Bryce Young there as well because he's behind those guys. At the 311, you're looking at Tyree Kill, Mark Andrews, CJ Stroud, Cooper Cup, or anyone going after that. At the 511, you're looking at guys like Tony Pollard, Javante Williams, uh, the 2023 108. So the question starts to become, you know, at the 104, you're probably getting like Jalen Hurts. You're not going to get Mahomes. You're probably not going to get Josh Allen. And I, I'm assuming Joe Burrow probably goes after that. So Jalen Hurts becomes probably the next guy up there or Justin Jefferson. So you can look at it like, hey, would I rather have my choice of Deshaun Watson or Bryce Young plus Tyree Kill plus Tony Pollard? Or would I rather have just Jalen Hurts? Would I rather have Brees Hall, CJ Stroud, and Javante Williams or Jalen Hurts? I think you can go either way. 
but you also have all of your secondary picks in those rounds as well. So you trade for the 2-3-5, but you also still have your 2-3-5, while that other team has zero of those picks in those rounds. So now you have two seconds, two two thirds, and two fifths. So depending on where that other guy went in the first round, I don't know where his first pick was. Maybe he has Jalen Hurts and Josh Allen. Maybe he has Jalen Hurts and Jamar Chase. So it's like through five rounds of your draft, you know, would you rather have Hurts and Chase, or would you rather have Deshaun Watson, Bryce Young, Tyreek Hill, Cooper Cup, Tony Pollard, and Jordan Addison, or you know, some combination of all these players. For me personally, I like the depth leaving the startup draft because it gives you a ton of flexibility to kind of do whatever you want with your roster, to trade picks, to do all that kind of stuff. So I think you know some people value like the high end elite players in dynasty and it also depends how many players are in your starting lineup you know so if there are if you're starting like 11 players or 12 players i would much rather have the depth side if you're only starting like eight or nine and it's super flex then yeah i'm probably thinking a little bit more towards the jalen hurt side because you only need a certain number of players but this is a lot of depth and a lot of really high quality picks like if that five turned into like the seven probably wouldn't love it if that three turned into the four probably wouldn't love it but the two three five is really juicy it's a really juicy package for one first round pick all right so those are five trades uh, i'm going to try to do a video like this every single week so again at any time you can join our discord go into the fantasy talk channel drop a screenshot of your trade use hashtag congrats scott in there and i will go back and look through the trades that get dropped in there throughout the week to use th for these videos okay i'm gonna discombobulate soon so uh if you enjoyed the video make sure you join the discord but subscribe to the channel as well because we'll be doing videos like this every week Hit the thumbs up button and i will see y'all tomorrow for an underdog stream also dropping the link to that in the discord just join the discord everything goes on in the discord sure. <laughs>